Last week, you were asked to explore the anatomy of light on a sphere. The week prior to that, you were concerned with the subterranean geometry upon which the sphere and its ellipses were constructed. And you needed that information so that you could plot the core of the shadow when you put this in Rembrandt lighting, which was 45 degrees above and 45 degrees in front of the subject. <clears throat> Much that's going on here is very good. The pencil's not being held correctly. It's all covered with marks, and I wanted you working on the side of your pencil, not on the point. And this is the first time I've really asked for the refinement of some skills. And this is not easy, working on the Ang paper with the Conti pencil. But it seems appropriate to start demanding some control over the medium. And this was the lesson in which I lowered the boom on you. It's called generosity, but some people think it's abuse. However, <clears throat> it's intelligent. There are dark halos around the light, reinforcing the light, light halos around the shadow that pass through the tabletop and the cast shadow. But both the dark halo and the light are excessive. They are outrageously excessive here, and they draw attention to themselves as devices Rather, being, rather than being so discreet that you don't notice that they're there. So the danger with Sunday painters who have a little information is that they overdo all of the devices and in the process ruin what they're up to. A little information sometimes is a very, very dangerous thing. So you have all had trouble with the assignment I think this is very clever designing it upside down. Who, who did this one? Well, you're doing very well. Uh, you're still making marks. Is that since I showed you how to yes. sharpen the pencil? I think you're on your way, don't you? The dark halo is aggressive. The cast shadow has a dark edge on it. I said that would describe a hole in the surface Metaphorically, we cannot draw the shadow the way we see it because it's ephemeral. It isn't substantial. So we don't give it a crisp, hard edge because if we do, we define the edge of a plane, the edge of a form. And I told that terrible story about the mice dancing on black and white tiles, I'm sure. I didn't tell that. I was too embarrassed to. All right. I've only been telling it for 30 years. I mean, good grief. Anastasia was here the first time I told it, so she at least is smiling in reverie. But the, the cast shadow is so dark that it looks like a hole in the surface. The vignette is too dark, and it draws attention to itself. The contrast on the edge of the table is too severe, and tonight I'll be explaining why. Because tonight I'm going to teach the zone system of value or aerial perspective. And I've taken the term zone system from Ansel Adams. I use it very differently, but nonetheless, we have to organize the way we use values. And I'll be discussing that this evening. So uh, they're all intelligent. Everything is where it should be. The dark, the light, the, the light halo passing through various elements. All of that's working. This is Ian's. Ian, you've got the cast shadow too close. If the light is coming from in front and hitting here, the cast shadow has to be behind. And you've got it too low in front. So what you've done is you've illuminated it as if it were lit from in front and 45 degrees above, and yet the cast shadows from a sphere that's being lit from above or behind. So uh, you didn't set the box in there. You just dropped a plane in. And you didn't measure it very carefully. Apart from that, it's terrific, OK? 
Has anyone any questions? I'll ask one moment. Whose is this one here? Mine. Okay. Uh, you can see the lights and the darks popping. This one jumps, that one jumps, it draws attention to itself. It has to be so delicately organized, it has to be the most, the smoothest transition you can possibly make because you're describing a flat plane that's being illuminated from one side and as the plane moves away from the light, it darkens and it darkens so slowly that there can't be any jumps in it. And the moment they are, there are, you're in trouble. This looks like two breasts. It looks like two hemispheres. Do you see it? Because we have this shape here and that shape there. Can you see a woman's chest here? Now, I don't think that's yours, Ian. I don't know what's on your mind, son, but, but you know, uh, the point I'm trying to make is that every tiny mistake you make in value change is likely to describe some plane, some form different from what it is you're drawing. So you violate the integrity of that flat, flat pane when you look at these that have been up here for a hundred years, you can see how this goes for dark from the vignette, then it gets light, then it goes dark for the halo for this zone three bottle, then it gets light to dark with a core and a reflected light, and this goes light up against the dark until it goes dark in the vignette. So we have a whole bunch of schemes that we're playing, and we have to do it so discreetly that there's no evidence that we're manipulating it. And we are, because we're trying to create the illusion of the third dimension on a two-dimensional surface. It's a trick, it's a lie, and if we don't do it discreetly, we draw attention to our devices, and in doing that, the cat's out of the bag. Nobody's impressed. It becomes ugly. You had a question, you know, sir. Um, loud, loud, loud. You had mentioned the thing yet, and that was actually one thing I had a problem with, was figuring out how dark is too dark. So what would you recommend for the transition? Proceed very carefully. It's a matter of taste. If you do it and it's too light, or too dark, it's bad taste. So what you're going to have to do is give it your best shot, stand back, look at it, cry a little bit, start again. And when it starts to work very discreetly, you'll know you're coming to terms with it. It's one of those things that depends on so many decisions you made early on in the rendering that I don't have a, an easy answer for you. But it is ultimately a matter of good and bad taste. When you begin to feel what is acceptable? What works? What reads? Does this look real? It isn't real, but does it have that sort of believability? Then you know you're getting close. So um, tonight's discussion will throw light on this. Anybody else? Yes. To measure the shadow? If, oh good, if the core is here and this is six o'clock and this is nine and this is five and this is four and this is five and seven and eight. So we're starting here at 730 and we've got a vertical line under eight and we're coming down so little. This is four o'clock. So we have this notional space. Do you see it? I plotted this, and if I come in, I might say this is four squares wide. So here are here are roughly four squares wide. Okay? However, this is coming down a third. Now I can find a third here. There's the third. So this is lower. And as I look at this, I see I'm going to swing to there to come to this point. This is coming here. This is falling here. This is coming from about there, and it's coming here. There now, 
and I'm coming from that corner up here to about here, and this is coming out about here. So if I say there's my sphere, and here is my cast shadow, in a straightforward, I guess this should have come in a little lower, in a straightforward measurement, I can approximate it. Do you see what I'm saying? The other thing that I had suggested that um, Ian attempted was to say, what if I come back and I set up my three-dimensional solid and I take this back a ways and I set up that plane. I'm lit from above, so I'm going to come in here and I'm going to set up all of my geometry for a an ellipse and if I sweep that through I have it as well. Do you see what I've just done? So I'm imagining that I have a cube and I'm taking that ground plane back and then I'm setting an ellipse on that. You'll look at where the shadow ends. So if you take this line and you say let's say this is halfway, you say this measures into that one and a half times, you've got to, you can measure back into the sphere and you can block out and place it. Does that make sense? You can take any shape. It really doesn't matter what it is. Here's a biomorphic shape. Let's say you simply set up a notional space and you say the proportions are one by one and three quarters, and then you come in and you can, you can break this down into halves and quarters. You can break this down also, and you can plot all of this with straight lines, and you can put it in a different rectangle. Are you with me? You can locate everything. You can enlarge it or you can say you want to put it in a, in a rectangle like this. Then you're going to stretch the whole thing out because whatever fell there, you're now putting here. The whole thing expands. People have been using this system of squaring up for everything. For centuries and centuries. It's uh, a way to measure anything in the three-dimensional world that you're going to place on a two-dimensional surface because your two-dimensional surface only has height and width. That's all you have to worry about, and the rest is the illusion. So you can use exaggerated perspective, make things diminish more rapidly than they really do. The one thing you don't want to do is err on the side of enlarging things as they go back. A lot of people, when they're drawing the figure, tend to make the far side of the male chest too large. Not realizing that a plane in perspective really diminishes rapidly. So if you've considered the rib cage as a plane in perspective, that's halfway. You make pectoral too large and it swings forward. It violates all suggestion of recession. So you've got to err on the side, if anything, Make it smaller. Exaggerate what you want it to do rather than allowing an error to violate any illusion whatsoever. So it's all trickery anyway. You just want to be careful. Any other questions? All right, then let's move into tonight's lesson. I've talked about aerial perspective when I've talked about rendering in line. I've said the relationship between the figure, the line, and the background, the ground, is critical if you're trying to create the illusion of recession. So without mechanical perspective, we apply the principles of aerial perspective. And they presuppose that you're looking at objects that are very, very far away. 
So systems that we would normally use in landscape painting, we now employ in still life and figure, where they really have no business. But we need to manipulate the material, and there is an existing system that works beautifully. We use it. If I make a mark on a dark ground, it advances. If I make a mark beside it that's lighter, even though it's the same length, it recedes. And as I go back, it recedes even further. Now, if I suggest aerial perspective, that clearly enhances the illusion. But what's really doing all the heavy lifting is the dark figure, the light figure on a dark ground and the less light figure being absorbed into the ground and appearing to recede. So if you're doing a set design and you want things in the background, you reduce the amount of contrast, you reduce the intensity of color, and you'll probably cool it in terms of color. And it will appear to recede even if it's very close. If on the other hand you use high contrast, very strong color, it's going, to, it's going to compete with all the costumes and everything else on the stage, and you will have defeated the purpose of the play. You'll become obtrusive. So, if if you followed the instructions for the still life the other day, the nearest bottle is darker than the second bottle, and the second bottle is darker and the third, and the tabletop has to be lighter still. That's a two-dimensional elevation, applying the principle of figure-to-ground relationships and aerial perspective. And it works. It works. Our problem now is, how do we Create the illusion of the third dimension. Well, happily, you now know how to construct cylinders, cones, and spheres. You've turned your bottle into a three-dimensional solid. So if I come into my zone one bottle, and I have a sphere here, and I have it attached to a cylinder, and I have, at this point, a series of cones and cylinders coming up until I get to the very top, I want to light all of this from one side. I want to reinforce that light with a dark halo. I want a shadow side on my bottle. I want to have a light halo throwing it forward on the shadow side. But I don't want my second bottle to be as light as my first. And though I want a, sh a light halo separating it from the background, I don't want it to be as contrasty as that one is going to be. This is going to later be a ground plane that light's falling on. So I want to bring this up and I want to blend that out into it. When you set your bottles up, you're going to do some lying. You're going to separate them so the one doesn't throw a cast shadow on another but I do want them to be fairly close to one another. So you'll, you'll stage manage that so that it doesn't cause any problems. So if I want to make that look light, I'm going to come in
with a lighter value here. I can't have it too light. So I'm going to blend that down until it's very much darker. In fact, I made a mistake. I want a dark halo here. Because I want the lit side of that up against a darker background. I want this to go dark, but I don't want it to be as dark as my zone one. It isn't easy manipulating these chalks, I, I regret to say. So we're going to come down here, and I will come in and stage manage that in a moment. So I have a scheme that I want to play, and I've asked you to have nine values, and I wanted white at the top, black at the bottom, and your number five value is your have to. So we're going to say that our nearest bottle is zone one. And I'm going to include white, but you'll have very little opportunity to use pure white paper. I'm going to run this from, say, a number six to a number one value. That's pretty contrasting, because I want this to be quite light. I want my highlight here. I want that to be fairly light. And I want a, a fairly light halo running around the outside of it and passing through the bottom of this bottle to throw this forward. And this can be quite light because I really want to throw my zone one bottle as close as I possibly can. Then I can come in here, and that's light enough for zone two, and I'm going to make it look lighter by taking a dark behind it, and that immediately lightens it, and I need a dark halo here to throw the top of this bottle forward because I really want that to stand out. Are you with me? Hmm? So to make that look lighter, I'm going to lay a light, a dark behind it. And here I can lighten that a tiny bit. And to make it look lighter, once again, I can darken this. But I don't want the degree of contrast that I have here. That I want to avoid. So I've got my light here. I've got my sphere. I've got a reflected light. And then I want a core of the shadow following the forms as it moves up. And I want a fairly dark line underneath this, where the bottle makes contact with the tabletop. And then coming back this way, I want to show a cast shadow. But I, as I say, I don't want it to hit the second bottle. And I've got a glitter point here and a highlight there. And you might have one here as well. The edge could be a little soft because you want it to turn. If you make the contrast between the light and the dark too strong, it won't roll around and turn like a cylinder turning away from you. So you want that edge to be fairly soft as it moves in, and it'll be more convincing. I'm always quoting Cezanne who said, the edge eludes me. Well, it eludes you because it isn't there. There is no edge. The form is continually turning away from you. And if you look closely at portraits where you get to the outside of the face, artists have always laid a whole series of glazes and washes, and there is no edge. But there are instead a whole bunch of overlapping elements that overlap and recede and turn the form. If you have too hot an edge, it flattens everything out. So we're coming in here. We've got a dock on this side. We want to move over to serve the light. Zone 2 now is at the edge of this serving zone 1. 
it's sacrificing its edge at that point to throw zone one ahead. And we now need a shaded portion here, and this will be there'll be less light falling on the cylinder. And we want a core. And on the other side of the core, we're going to have a reflected light. We're going to come up against the dock here, and it's going to pass all the way down. And we can lighten that a bit. We don't want to lighten much, because we want it to be absorbed into the darker background. And we certainly want to keep it down and soft. So that's pushing that back. And you don't have to worry too much about the third dimension in the last bottle. If your arrangement allows you to put in a core with reflected light, fine. If you don't have it, that's all right. Then we're coming in, and I've got to establish a vignette. Now, I'm hoping, Marshall, to show you what we're after with a vignette. I promised I'd show you. So from this, which is really very dark, I've got to move in to the light halos on the right of my bottles. So I get a smooth transition here. And what I'm after in this background is the transition from dark to light to dark. Because what I want to throb through this is for this to go light Pardon me, dark to light to dark to light to dark to light to dark to light to dark all the way through. I want that counter change, that counterpoint, I want that to be constantly changing in an effort to create the greatest degree of variety that I possibly can. So this is rather abrasive and excessive, but these chalks are really very difficult to, to operate. So we have this plane that has to be light, because the light's coming from above and it's hitting this plane. But we want the darker vignette all the way through. Let me bring this up about to here, and then If I set this up against a white border, my, my hope is that this looks as if it exists in a space, which, which is what I'm trying to achieve, as if there's a recession. I apologize for the fact that it's so difficult to manipulate these chalks on a black ground. I've looked for and I can't find a number five gray blackboard. That would be wonderful. So far I've not found it. So I need a dark line on the edge of this with it's getting darker on the other side. I need a dark line on the edge of this. I want it to dissolve. I can have a dark line here but it's got to as this one does, come into the bottle, come into the bottle. This can come in also. I can define this a little bit. And this is starting. Then we'll, we'll start playing with cast shadows. And you want to be very careful that you don't make 
the bits of light between the cast shadows so bright that they jump forward. So the answer is to make them darker that you, than you see them. Always make the cast shadow to have a soft edge. And I think you'll see how it works. What I'd like to stress here is that zone one will be a light and something around five or six. Zone two will be, say, a number three value coming down to a number seven. And zone three will be a number four coming down to an eight. And four will be variegated going from dark to light, but modulated so that it isn't too contrasty. So what you have is a hierarchy. Some zones are more important than others. And the one that you wish to push forward is the most important. I want you in this drawing one class, and it may serve you for many years later as well, to always invest your maximum contrast, your highest degree of contrast, in the most important element in your value scheme. So that where you have your dark as dark in a dark scheme, you have your lightest light, and there won't be comparable contrasts anywhere else in the scheme. In painting one, I say, I want you to think in terms of a chorus dressed in, say, a purple gown, and a singer comes out in a white gown that's the soloist. So the color code has already separated and created a hierarchy between the mass singers and the solo singer. And if somebody in the chorus takes the solo, you're going to be very upset, confused, and probably leave to have a beer. Because that isn't what they suggested with the color coding. They suggested something quite different. We're going to look at the way people use and misuse value in their designs, and I think that's going to go a long way to helping you to understand what I'm talking about. So our aerial perspective will be zone one holds the largest and strongest contrast, zone two is subordinate to it, zone three subordinate to the two before it, four, five, six, and seven, however many you're going to use, you know what to do with them. And that means that you cannot shift your attention from one area to another in your piece, oblivious of, to what you're doing. Everything has to relate to a scheme. And you look at a lot of people and they're using zone one everywhere. Everything has hard edges, it's hard contrast. Eventually you turn it to the wall, you can't stand looking at it, it has no mood, it has no atmosphere. It's offensive. It's not consistent with our experience because when we look at somebody or something, we see them in sharp, clear, hard focus, and everything around them in peripheral vision loses contrast, loses color intensity, and is diffused. So if you're learning how to draw and paint, you learn how to focus and to squint. And the minute you do that, what you're focused on will be sharp and crisp, and everything else will immediately fall into a zone system. So you can, you can trick your vision, contrive to see in ways that will support you. And when I was in art school, my professors used to say, Myron squint. I bumped into a lot of things, but I didn't know why I was squinting. And years later, I discovered, nobody explained it to me, it just became obvious that if you, if you don't look at some massive information and squint focusing on the subject you're going to stress, Everything commands zone one attention, and that's disruptive. That'll break up the unity of the piece, and you won't have a hierarchy. You won't have a control. So let's take a look at some slides, see if that will help clarify. Start with review of the homework. Let's apply the zone system to the homework. 
the darkest dark and the lightest light occur in zone one. Zone two will be the whole sphere and it'll have a light halo throwing it forward on the shadow side and a darker halo running all the way down this side from 12 o'clock or 12.30 down here to 7. Now it's going from dark to light to dark to light to dark to light to dark to light to dark in every direction but the transitions are slow. They're gentle. There are no lines. There are no marks. And it evokes a sense of space. The sphere has volume. The way the cast shadow lightly and softly lays on that tabletop describes the tabletop. It's going a long way to making this look as if it's close to you here and farther away there. And the contrast here is too great. That's the flaw. Because if this is zone one and this is zone two and this is zone three and that's zone four, that degree of contrast is competing with a lot of things. I have, a, I have a canon upon which I can base criticism and I can teach and the student can see the error of his, her, their way and they can correct it. So it's imperative in a, in a foundation drawing course that you make your purposes clear, you explain what you want and then when students trying to digest an awful lot of information make mistakes, they will still hear the echo of what you said the first time when you offer them criticism. And now you can demonstrate to them why what they've done doesn't work. The vignette here, Marshall, is very nicely done. Do you see it? It's really very delicately done. We need the value step scale because we want mood. And if everything we do is in these light values, we will have a high key rendering. And I'll show you some examples of that. If we're coming down into this area where everything is very much darker, but we have a light accent, we've got a low key, and we'll look at some pieces that will show that. So here we have a number five gray in the circle, which looks light against the darks and dark against the light, and dissolves in a number five. The principle of simultaneous contrast of value makes that white look lighter here than it does there, but that's a consequence of that dark coming up against it because Simultaneous contrast of value dictated that where a dark approach to light, the dark would look darker and the light would look lighter, and we see that's happening. And if we look here, we'll see this gray circle has a light halo on the outside and appears to be darker on the inside. That's happening in your, in your optical equipment. That's not happening on the board. That's what you perceive because of the way we perceive contrast. So an artist will combine these nine values and he's really only playing with seven because one is black and one is white. And he's got to generate something that convinces the viewer that his subject embraces the many thousands of value changes that exist in nature. I think somebody once told me there were 45,000 values in nature. And the artist works with nine, ten, in the case of Corot, 20 values and no more. And yet there's never a question when you look at a wonderful piece of art that they've stage managed the relationships between these to create mood, a sense of space, and tremendous unity. And on top of everything, a wonderful degree of variety, which is what you're all after. So that which is coming from the low end of the scale, docks and docks, is low key. And that which is on this high end, we're going to call a high key. And if we have something that falls pretty much in the middle, it will be a, a less powerful scheme in terms of mood than the extremes. So we can think in terms of all kinds of combination of values because we have to develop some kind of schematic method of working. Here Kathy Kolowitz has lit that table from some source that I, I haven't identified yet, but it reflects up into the faces of these conspirators hiding in the corner of some inn discussing some scheme that probably isn't legal or living underneath a 
fascist state where thinking about anything is a, is, is a crime. But she's done it, hasn't she? This is a low-key painting. If you cover this with your hand, you'll see how dark everything is. And this light keys it. The docks look darker now that we have a light and we have a focal point. Our eye rushes to that table and then we discover all the light reflecting into the faces of the conspirators. And Marshall, you see at this point in her career working with this lithograph, she's able to run her crayon in any direction she wants. She can get texture, but you'll notice that while this all flickers with lights and darks, it stays where it belongs. So we have zone one, zone two, zone three, and then everything else will be saved as zone four. But she wouldn't make any of these more contrasty because the moment she did, she'd violate the, the hierarchy and she'd create, she'd destroy the mood and she would undermine her own scheme. Lautrec, I think, has made a mistake. The young woman's hair is too dark for the background. But you have to remember, this is not the painting by Lautrec. This is probably a sixth generation reproduction. Who knows what the original was? I've never seen this piece. So uh, it's in a private collection. So I don't quite know what changes have taken place in the process of reproducing it as often as it's been reproduced and photographed. But I regret that she's cut off at the waist that appears not to have anything below her waist and that all of this disappears into the background. And I'm a little annoyed that this is all too dark. This is how high contrast destroys mood destroys atmosphere. This is high key. All these lights upon lights, and these are a mistake, in my view. Take your finger, your thumb, close one eye, and cover that, and suddenly the docks are going to be in the candlestick and the lady's hair. It's going to, if you, re, if you get used to it by covering that, and looking with one eye, and then you expose it, you'll see that becomes the subject of the whole piece. There is your zone one contrast, and it's just violated the hopes of this working, gelling, having unity. It's the lamp that's too light in the Kathy Kollowitz, but she had the good sense not to make that light, that lamp too light. She had the good sense not to violate the integrity of everything by bringing something foolish into an area where it didn't belong. And I think this is a flaw, and I don't like that very much. It's not a great painting, but the point is, it's a wonderful example of what you can do wrong. Use your contrast very, very carefully, and if you want that to go way back from this head, you don't make it more contrasty than this. And one other thing you don't do is put something like that up against an edge in the vignette, where normally people are anticipating the frame, and they don't want a lot of busy two-dimensional figures vibrating outside of the center ring of the circus. This is where you pay the top price, so you can see all the events in the center circle, the center ring. To have these things off on one side is to defeat the scheme. So if I can make my intentions clear enough, I have a, I have a foundation for criticism when it comes to your work. This is high key, and the eyes really in this Rubens' portrait accent everything. That's what keys it. Everything else is fairly light. The hair's been kept fairly soft as well. He's working with cores, reflected lights, reflected lights, cores all the way through. There are hemispherical lobes on either side of the lower lip, the middle of the upper lip. The nose is reticulated into some diamond shapes. He's made you feel the fullness of the eye because he's exaggerated how the light falls on the low edge of the lower light, lid. He's done it in both. In fact, the white of the eye and the lit upper, lit, upper edge of that lid almost merge. There's a book by Vanderpool that shows you how to draw eyes. And what he's doing is he's showing you how artists have solved the problem of making eyes look volumetric. Because if you copy what you see, it don't work. It just doesn't work. And the Egyptians knew this. The Abyssinians, everybody knew it. Hmm? They knew you had to exaggerate so that when the light fell on objects or when you describe light falling on the eyes or what have you, it had to look three-dimensional. This is 
Not a great painting, but it certainly serves to show you a zone system in very high relief. While we have light and dark cows on a half tone, so that the light is in contrast with the background and the dark is in contrast, this is all a foreground in which darks predominate. This is on the square. This is our dominant diagonal. You can see how this, this, and that all line up. This is our dominant vertical, as I said, on the square. And then we move from the foreground into the middle ground. The color is much less intense than it is here. Everything is unified because it's very much lighter, having been drawn from the high end of the value step scale. So here we're using all low-key relationships with some accents of light to key them. Here, there aren't any darks, there aren't any excessive lights, but all the values are very close together, and all of the colors are very neutral. They recede. The mountains are even more unified. They're darker than this, but they're not as dark as that, and they form a screen so that this is going from dark to light to dark to light to dark to light to dark to the light sky. But these are called screens, and by being light on dark and light on dark and dark on light, they overlap as planes. In the theater, they would be called tormentors. And they'd be on either side of the stage, and they'd recede along the stage, and they would heighten the illusion of depth. And you, if you were clever with it, you could make the stage look much deeper than it was. Then we come to the sky, and it's back almost to the lightness of this middle pa passage, but the colors are cool. The intensities are very weak. It recedes. It becomes a little bit more intense at the top than here, and it suggests that the hemisphere of the sky is coming toward us. So we have zone 1, zone 2, zone 3, zone 4, zone 5 at the horizon. It works. There are light halos along these edges to make these darks look darker. And there are light halos along these edges to make these darks, which are not darker, look darker. There are there are situations where along this edge we might make this darker and avoid the light halo, but you can see the light halo has been brought in to bring this tree well ahead of those behind it. So what you were doing with the sphere you can do here now with each of the screens, masses, hemispherical forms which are underlying these trees. This is not a very good illustration of describing volumes because the background is too light, and it really flattens everything out. And this doesn't look like uh, something that comes forward and goes back. I'm not too certain what that's supposed to be. But uh, the light's coming from above. It lights this in zone one. This would be zone two. This would be zone three. And we have one, two, three planes. This looks more volumetric than that by virtue of the fact that it's been modeled. And this halo running along the edge isn't doing the heavy lifting that a 45 degree angle ellipse in the third would do. That was the Rembrandt lighting, and it gives you a much more convincing presentation of a volume. This Chinese artist has a sense of humor. He knows all the rules of aerial perspective and he's having fun. I guess these are persimmons. And he knows that each one of these stems is the same dock, so it's all, they're all in one space. He knows that this fruit will move ahead of that one because it's in greater contrast with the ground, but it's supposed to be behind it because anything that goes up and is higher we're to read as it's receding. So he violates, he violates that recession by increasing the contrast. So we can read these stems as all being hanging from, a, from strings along the same bar in the same distance. And then we can see these, these pieces of fruit dancing in and out, forward and backward, and playing games.
It's all designed on the section. It's all very cleverly done. But he's playing loose and free with values for the purposes of variety and entertainment. When I first heard this, saw this drawing by George Seurat, I realized I had hit a gold mine. Because in looking at this, I realized he had given me everything I needed to teach an aerial perspective zone system rendering in value. He said, if I rebate the square and I put my dominant figure in the lower portion of this composition and I make, my, I make his blouse the lightest light up against the darkest dark and his trousers the darkest dark up against the light, one, he's low, two, he's in higher contrast, he advances. Zone two figure has no lights comparable to zone one. The darks may be equally as dark, but they're not supported by comparable lights. The figure is higher up in the scheme, and it recedes. But it doesn't recede as much as the woman walking away with her basket because of her scale to the other two. She's so much smaller, and she's in such diminished contrast. She goes back. Nonetheless, there's a light halo supporting the darks, a dark halo supporting the lights, and it's true in her too. Now, what's he doing this for? Why would he introduce this high contrast on the edges near our vignette and violate the integrity of this aerial perspective? I wasn't there. I haven't had the opportunity to ask him. But in guessing, I would say he, like Cezanne and Magritte, the surrealist, Don't for a moment want you to confuse this with reality. This is not real, this is a drawing. So it would appear that he's saying, I'm going to bring you back to the surface of the paper to remind you how flat this piece of paper is, and I want you to admire how cleverly I've organized all of the material on it. I think that's what he's doing. Cezanne purposely leaves raw canvas showing in many of his paintings, as a reminder that this isn't a view of Mont Saint Victoire, this is a painting of a view of Mont Saint Victoire. And Marguerite paints a pipe. And underneath it in French it says, This is not a pipe. It's not a pipe, it's a painting. He wants you to know it's a painting. But he's, he's just snickering, he's just playing a little joke. But nonetheless, I believe that's why those notes out here are jumping zones. Here is, I forget who she is. Who is she? Alice. Alice in Wonderland. The color in this was instructed by Fletcher, the fellow who wrote our book on color theory. He'd been hired by Disney at about the time Disney was producing these classics, and he was training all of the animators to use color and value very effectively. I, I've always thought that was kind of fun. But here we have a warm note, in a, or a, a cool note in an overall warm scheme. But the contrast is zone one, zone two, zone three, zone four. You see what he's doing, and there's no question about what the subject is. This runs a little risk of becoming a little too important, both by placement and by contrast. But it's controlled. You don't need to play with the third dimensional volume at all. These are all flat shapes, every one of them. But the fellow in the boat advances because of that light behind him ahead of this little island with these trees on it. These are smaller, they recede. All of this is lighter with a light halo throwing it back and there are light halos around these edges as well so that we have zone one, zone two, three, four, five, six, if you will. But they're all flat. Yes. I have no idea. It was an illustration, perhaps in the anatomy by, of trees by Cole. I, I suspect that's where I got it. It's an excellent book. The opening uh, essay covers just about everything I try to cover in this course. It's an excellent little book. Yeah, The Anatomy of Trees by Cole. 
He also does Perspective for Artists, which is much less successful. Two-dimensional, but it's atmospheric. They're both low-key. There aren't any lights in it. It's moody. It seems like sunrise or sunset. It seems like the beginning of the day. There are flaws in this. I wonder if you beginners can tell me what they are. This is, this is too light? No, I don't think so. The contrast of that branch against the back, I don't think so. I'm going to ask you to close one eye and cover this with your thumb. Get used to it. Hold your thumb up there. Keep that covered. Does that improve the design? Now, now pull your thumb down and look at that jump forward. This is intrusive. That is violating the integrity of this zone, which should be light to, to provide a background for this tree. For that matter, this is intrusive as well. Your subject is the tree. What if we cover all of this by holding our hand up and look at that thing start to breathe. Look at it open up. Get used to it. Don't take your hand down. Keep it there. Do you see how elegant that big tree is up against a complementary background that doesn't compete with it? Now remove your hand and the thing dies. Did you see it? I see what you're saying, but what if you were in a situation like that and you were so taken by brightness outside of the darkness where you were? How would you do it differently? Well, you would do what I've suggested because I've increased the brightness and I haven't made all these docks interfere with brightness. If you wanted to celebrate the brightness outside of this shaded area, you wouldn't put these docks in it, would you? Does that answer your question or have you... Yeah. Okay. So it's full of flaws. But you see, this is well done. And if it were to get rid of these noises in the background, it could breathe and spread its wings and fly. This is Mirandi. He's a master of value. He's got a sense of humor. He loves to break the rules. In this case, he's following the rules and he's playing close to my zone system. Zone one, this is an etching. Zone two, zone three, zone four, zone five, zone six. And this is a transitional zone that takes us back. Everything is politely honoring a hierarchy. The thing breathes. And he distorts everything. Every time you see a change of direction along these edge, edges, you can carry it through. You'll begin to see what's going on. Every inflection on the edge is part of his golden section scheme. You see how this comes down and this drops and this changes and this comes out and dents and so forth? He's having a party with these edges. This is DJ Zaccanini. He called me from California this week and sent me some scans of what he's up to. This is about movement because these oilers, these cans, look as if they're doing something of a dance in a circle and we're moving around. They're pointing in different directions. But this is zone one. Lightest light up against the darkest dark. The light's up against darks. The dark's up against lights. Light against dark. Dark against light. Then this is all dark against light. And here he starts playing all these changes. The cast shadows are kept soft, full of reflected light. The zoning works. Zone one, zone two, zone three. This passes behind and dissolves in that dark halo. This comes down to support that light rim, and it gets dark here in the core to support that light. Everything behind zone one sacrifices its independence to support zone one. This gets darker here, even though that's the, the lit side, to serve the need for a dark halo along this edge. This becomes dark to, to emphasize that bit of reflected light. So observation's important, but you have to stage manage it to get it to work. So tonight, when you drew a multiple unit still life, I want you to establish zone one and be very careful about how the docks are supported by lights, how things approaching it dissolve into light 
halos, dark halos, very critical, and you have to watch where the reflections are, etc. So you're going to have to learn how to see. This is a caricature of President Carter. I don't think it's rude. I think the man said, well, the fellow has a wonderful smile, but he's got the teeth of some jackass. And I'm going to exaggerate them and make them larger. And I'm going to make them the subject. And if I'm going to make them the subject, zone one is going to have the highest contrast in light and dark. And nobody's going to be confused about what's important in this. So the eye goes right to these rather exaggerated teeth. As we move up toward the top, we move into the realm of vignette and everything dissolves. He didn't want shapes around the outside. Even this far side of the forehead dissolves in the background. The shirt dissolves. I think it's eminently successful. It does what the man wanted to do with a sense of humor. And he wasn't vicious. This is a disaster. Why? Why would I say something as rude as that? Can any of you see flaws? Yes. Well, um, it, I think the subject might have been like his face, maybe, but the contrast between his shirt and his coat is we drawn to that instead. That's bad, but what about that? Do you think the most important thing about Napoleon's face was a fat on his neck? Well, that's the maximum contrast, isn't it? That's zone one. This fellow rendered that with real care, but he wasn't looking at the hole. He lost track of what he was up to. You squint, the face disappears. The face is in shadow. The face should be illuminated. It's the subject. So he's investing his greatest contrast here, in the buttons, in the jacket. It's a disaster. It's not a successful piece. I don't think. This is successful. This is wonderfully successful. This is Kruger. No, 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 no. No, I don't know who did Carter. This is a contemporary German caricaturist who traveled with the Rolling Stones for a year. I bet he went into cardiac arrest when it was all over. But anyway, he, he's using photorealistic painting techniques. That hair is real. That wet, wet mouth is wet. Those teeth look convincing. The gums are soaking wet. He's, he's diminished the, the eyes and the nose as he's grossly exaggerated the mouth and the teeth. He's had a perfectly wonderful time. And it's fun, but it's well done. It's in Route 2. And this is photorealism. When I was visiting a college I'd previously taught art at after I'd been away in England for about eight years, I walked through the past the studio and was shocked to see students projecting 35 millimeter color slides onto canvases and they were copying the color of the projected slide. And as you see here, on the right it was a fresh slide but as they moved across the light was melting it and fading the color. It was so strong, the projection light. So we lose the color. This has nothing to do with art. This has nothing to do with drawing. This has less to do with design or art. It's simply a photograph reproduced on a canvas and all we can assume is that the zone one was the price tag on these particularly ugly shoes. And he, he labored the reflection of this automobile in the background. It didn't help. Nothing is going to help this. I really don't think you'd want it in your home. But this is what happens when you don't have any notion of design, value, color, perspective. And this is what happens when you love anatomy, you're interested in wildlife, you've studied these game birds, and you've worked out the anatomy of the back, and you've simplified the way the, the wings are thrusting and pushing air to raise this as a goose or a duck into the air and how delicately it's worked and where the interest is you have the highest degree of contrast everything's been highly simplified the softness of all of this gives you the impression that it's actually moving the young man betrayed me studied with me full year, for two years full time 
and snuck off to Harvard and became a doctor. You can't trust anybody. Maria Cassindus was one of America's greatest portrait photographers. There once was a, a photographic firm that made cameras, instant prints, called Polaroid Land. And I understand they designed an 8x10 camera with 8x10 instant film for her. This is your zone one high focus. So photography isn't any different from any other kind of picture building. She focused on this hand, not the child's face. This is the subject, not her head. She lit her in a mysterious way. She played with this gorgeous arabesque. So there's a fluid movement running through all of this. And there is this line of movement, there's your dominant direction. And this is the movement of the whole, and it sweeps up. She studied at the Boston Museum of Fine Arts School painting, and then studied with Ansel Adams black and white photography, and then launched her career bringing color and contrast together. Picasso paints a portrait of somebody he's making fun of, I'm sure. It's a large painting. This is a smirk. It has to be. This is a rather overweight lady. He's made everything extremely thick, you see, in an effort to continue to say, this is a lady with a hat on, walking along with two pet Pekingese. It isn't a still life, I'm sure. It's a joke. But he learned all of these things I'm trying to teach here at a very early age. So he has light halos around the darks, dark halos around the lights, a light halo here, a dark halo there. This is passage where it dissolves, lost and found form. This is passage. You see one stroke and he's got a light halo. His cast shadows are soft. They have reflected light in them. When there was this huge Picasso retrospective at the Museum of Modern Art, I prayed that they would have a poster of this. They didn't. I was very disappointed. I think it's great fun. But my point is, you never lose this because this is the way you get things to work on a flat surface. Escher says, I have to work everything out mathematically. I can't draw. So here is a zone one unit, zone two, zone three, four, five, six. He keeps going back farther and farther and farther. And there is a sense of atmosphere. Even if these objects look cartoony, very contrived, and not at all realistic. But they work. He defines a space because he has a handle on hierarchy, aerial perspective. I was in the Pierpoint Morgan Library in New York City, and I was shocked to see a Tiepolo drawing, this is by Tiepolo, of the side of a wall, and there was a roof seen over the top of the wall. And what shocked me was, it was a drawing like this, and like this was absolutely filled with glowing sunlight. Can you see how brilliant the sun is shining on this man's back? Now, what is creating that illusion? This is the shadow side of the back, and it's flooded with reflected light. It's flooded with reflected light, and the light is ripping through here and bouncing up into all of this. So we are celebrating sunshine. We're celebrating the Adriatic. We're celebrating... Venice, wonderful, wonderful. It's full of joy and life celebration. Piazzetta is his contemporary. He's drawing a couple. I believe this is his son who modeled for him frequently. There's a lot of reflected light coming off this child's blouse into both their faces. Look at how light the shadow side of the underside of her chin is. That's reflected light. The core of the shadow of the cheek is here, the core is here, and there's reflected light. We can see that the cheek is coming ahead and cutting off the nostril, and the jowl is cutting off the edge of the mouth. We can see there's an eyeball under there, and he's formed that as a perfect hemisphere very successfully. This is a tour de force. 
the hand on the shoulder, the upper arm, the forearm, the wrist, the palm, the fingers, and then the young man's collar. The collar overlaps the neck. It is a wonderful series of overlapping screens, magnificently managed, and this is zone one. Complete control. Very successful. Proudhon did these va value studies. His light halos tend to get carried away and they, they, they're thrown forward by the darks. He doesn't use enough reflected light in here. He never could draw a neck effectively. Certainly this deltoid doesn't fit into that upper arm. He has other problems. As slick as it looks, He's not the master that he's given credit for. This is by a 14-year-old girl who came to study with me for two years from California, Rasa Heda. I think it's an extraordinary drawing for such a young child. The fullness and volume of those eyes. This is Giuliano de' Medici by Michelangelo. We have a bust here that you can draw from. All of the reflected light in here works. And you'll notice that there's a box around each of these curls and it points in a particular direction. And there's the top and the side and the front. And by turning it into a three-dimensional solid, she can give it volume. And by lighting it perfectly, she can enhance the illusion of volume, which is what this is all about. The mouth really does look like a shelf system and that the lips do move and have form. This is a photograph I took of the Houdon cast that we have, and I lit it so that I would have a light and a shadow and a core and a reflected light and a cast shadow in every one of these events. So if you've come to understand how you use light, photography should be a breeze. It should be so easy, and I would encourage all of you to start taking some pictures when you finish this particular assignment, because when you look into your ground glass, you should be looking in with a brand new eye. Scan the outside edges so there's nothing intrusive that's going to ruin the system. And then he posts the guy here is playing with this female torso in a highly inventive, abstract way, exaggerating and emphasizing cast shadows for the purpose of pattern and rhythm and reversal. And once you've mastered the rules, you can break them. And this is what you're going to do. You're going to see that from 9 o'clock down, it's dark against light. From 9 o'clock up, it's dark against light. And then it's going to be from about 1 o'clock down to about 5, it's going to be light against dark. And then it's going to re reverse dark against light. Cast shadow is soft. Zone 1. Zone two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It works. It recedes. This is by the young architect, Rudy Ellett. He did a wonderful job, designed it well, rendered it beautifully. You can walk around these and see all the changes. This is dark against that, light up against this. Every subtle change and the transition from dark to light is inconspicuous, discreet doesn't draw attention to itself. This is what you're going to do. So I'm going to ask you to draw the nearest bottle to you. And the nearest bottle will be the lowest one. I don't want a carefully measured drawing. I want a freehand line drawing, and I want the ellipses. Draw it as carefully as you can. If you can lightly measure this and do the drawing in the notional space, that will help you. And then later you'll place the notional space of this little jar up against it. And you can measure the width of this into the width of that, etc. And see where this falls. It looks like it falls at the quarter, doesn't it? So make sure it intersects here. And then come up and you've got this ridge here and that's the bottom of this mayonnaise jar. So you'll do these three bottles and then you will walk around this and you will get all of those bottles to reinforce zone one. You won't allow this to get light enough to compete with this or that to get light enough to compete with this. And you'll notice as you move up closer to the light, 
these tops get lighter. Don't make them lighter. You'll violate the zone. Insist on having zone one, zone two, three, four. These two can be five, six, seven, and eight. You won't get past mo most of this in the time remaining tonight. You just won't. Because I want you to be meticulous in obs observing everything. And when it comes to seeing what you're going to do here, you've got to compare that light to this one and diminish it so that it does not compete. So this is not as light as that. This is not as light as this. These two are not as light as that. Do you see what I'm saying? Were they? Who knows? The need for a hierarchy, the need for a zone system, the need to describe space, both in perspective, aerial and mechanical, required manipulating the relationships. That's what art's about. Sanderson at the academy once came up to one of my students who was belaboring some detail in a drawing, and he said, Charles, come on. Draw the drawing. I thought it was beautiful. Charles McCloskey reported that to me, and I've remembered it ever since. The drawing's the most important thing, not the subject. Your interpretation's the most important thing. Don't be tyrannized by the subject. Cartier Bresson, the great photographer, says, the amateur photographer is tyrannized by detail. They don't leave anything out. And the master photographer opens his lens up wide so that only that which is in sharp focus is important and everything else is out of focus. Don't shake the camera. Sharpen your pencils. Retire to the other room. Let's see what you can do. Start with the bottle closest to you, please. Cheers. <laughs>
and you've got a third of it done, and you've got the most important third painted, drawn, rendered, whatever you wish. Bang. Everything's ordered. Because this relates to zone one, that relates to zone one, all of this serves zone one, that does. You cast shadows. It's easy to render the rest. Now, maybe it's not such a good idea to go out that far because you run the risk of rubbing your hand over this. So one of the things you can do is get yourself a piece of lattice and put a little stand on the end so you can rest your wrist on this and your paper is separated and you can still have good control. It's called a bridge. Or you can run a mall stick and hold this in one hand and have the other hand with your pencil over the paper. A lot of us have been using mall sticks, but the bridge for drawing is much the easiest and it can be very inexpensive. And they sell the plastic ones over at like Big Blitz and stuff. Really? They have them in plastic? I think so. I have one upstairs. All right, show it to me because I didn't know that anybody manufactured them. How much were they? Two bucks. It's not all that much. Yeah, well, apparently Dick Blake sells them. And it's a very convenient thing for painting and drawing. So remember, if you can get zone one, establish in relationship to zone two and three and four, <laughs> you've got it solved. That's the challenge. Because zone one will come closer than two, which will be closer than three, which will be closer than four. You've already established the push-pull, and what that means is You are looking down on top of a bottle, which is zone one. Your zone two bottle is here. Your zone three bottle is here. And your background is zone four. So as you move back, you're going to change the number of values that fall into that zone. They're going to come closer together and be less contrasting couldn't be simpler. Really couldn't be simpler. But you have to stay in charge. And too many of you got a little of this done and started doing these others and that was a waste of time. Because until you have this established, you don't know what you're going to do in the other areas. So there. I warned you. Any questions? You want to sharpen your pencil the way my assistants have shown you getting rid of all this wood, filing this to a needle point. If there's any ridge in it, it's going to make a mark. And if you have it sharpened properly, properly it'll do all the heavy lifting for you. If she's got her zone one contrast, that's very light because she needs it for the edge of this, but that is a zone three because that's higher than this. This is zone two, that's zone three and this is zone 4, and that will be zone 5, and she's allowed all of this to merge into a single unified shadow. She's accented the bottom here. She's given you a good deal of reflected light up into all of these shaded sides. The background goes from dark to light, to dark to serve this, to dark to the end. It's really very, very well done. And then she did color studies, and ultimately a painting, and many of those larger paintings sold. And this is the painting, and it is all very neutral and cool because it's in a warm key. Or was this just a value underpainting? I think it was. A, I think this was the final, wasn't it? Yeah. 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 There's a warm touch in here if you close enough to see it. This is DJ Zaccanini, and the value rendering is beautifully done. core isn't very good. The core isn't showing that swelling. This should have been like this because it would have been the other side of that. Do you see what I'm saying? You have to imagine taking a knife and cutting through this pair and if you did do something as cruel as that, what you would discover is that this would come this way to reflect this would be the beginning 
the, the center, and this would be running across here, and this would come down this way, and this would come like that. So that's what, maybe this would come a little lower, but that's what this would look like if it were cut. Now this is called a horizontal section line. If you were to cut through there, the edge would show you the way in which all of this could thereafter be reticulated. Do you see what I'm saying? Hmm? But this will be the flat surface. Your core has to describe the form. Now, my criticism of DJ's drawing is that his core fails to do that. It's a straight line. When it should have shown the swelling of the belly of that pear. So you will set up your still life. You'll light it at 45 degrees above, 45 degrees closer to you. If the first bottle casts a shadow on the second bottle, you'll move it closer to you. But when you draw, you'll draw that lower. Because you don't want great spaces between them. You don't want hard edges on your cast shadow, and you don't want the light elements between these cast shadows to be too light. That's enough. This starts to be framed by this dark, that dark, and this dark, and if you squint, it's thrown forward. Remember I showed you Seurat's drawing of the young man for the <coughs> bathers? and there was a triangle behind his calf and his thigh, framed by his calf and his thigh, and Seurat put a lot of value in there so it wouldn't pop forward. That's what you're going to have to do here. You have to manage this so it stays in its place. And what you see won't do that for you. Yes? Can you repeat the lighting? The lighting, I'll remind me and I'll show you at the end of this discussion. This is too soft. This is the young doctor who betrayed me. It's too soft. The first zone is too contrasting, the others are too soft. The drawing is very good, but the value isn't. This is very good, but they don't quite sit on the ground plane. And there are elements that are too burned away. So this zone one is fine up to here, but all of this is too light. It should have continued, and it should have been darker down here. and. This should have remained darker to throw this forward. This is co almost competing with this. It's, this could have been a little darker, and this could have been a little darker, and we could have used a more pronounced core. And burning this all up in reflected light is ruining the contact it might have had with the ground plate. This is weak too. It looks as if it's higher here than there. We wanted to kiss that ground plane with a bang. Now. This is much more effective. This little pool of shadow right underneath really gets it to lay on that plane, and it isn't doing it here. So it's a device that you use that you've been told you need to accomplish that task. Later, your purpose in drawing and painting will be to express something very important to you. This becomes the machinery that will allow you to do it, and you'll be able to distort, exaggerate, manipulate everything so that your intention is made very much clearer than it might otherwise be. But to start with, you have to learn twinkle, little, twinkle, twinkle, little star and real simple addition so you can solve easy problems. So this is our, our model for zoning. And if every value is up against a, a different value, it will always look like a different relationship. So it's, <clears throat> each of the values could be up against one, two, three, four, five, seven and eight, and nine, and it would look different from other combinations. And this means that you can mix and match different relationships to achieve the illusion of you're using many, many more values than you actually are. So I just do want to go back to one thing. This is a superb rendering of the tops of the bottles. Enormous care has been taken here. The problem is 
both of these are too close to each other in contrast. This isn't quite zone one, but it's not zone two. Are you following me and am I making some sense? Do you begin to realize how much you have to force this into this mold? So it, I have professional artists who come here and I marvel because they say, how do you teach your students to fill their drawings with so much atmosphere? They look as if you can walk into them. I haven't seen drawings like this before. Well, the system of aerial perspective and zoning that I'm teaching you tonight will go a long way to achieving that. There are a lot of still life painters coming out of the various programs in this country whose work is very flat and it lacks atmosphere and it doesn't look as if little creatures like bugs could crawl around behind the fruit and over them and into it. They look out like they look like cut out pastons because people don't know how to model, model form. They don't know how to light it. One of, one of the fun things I do here is I teach people having, since they've taken drawing one, I pull out the plastic casts we have, I show them how to light them, get their digital cameras out. They're stunned by the effects they get. I've had students who've had only two weeks or one week of study on photography with me go home after leaving for the summer and get jobs as photographers because their work is better than kids graduating from college. What the kid graduating from college doesn't have is a foundation in drawing and design. Now you've got to remember the 19th century when photography became all the rage, <clears throat> the first person to lose his job was a portrait painter. It was trendy to have your photograph taken. You didn't have to sit there for endless hours. It didn't cost you an arm and a leg. And it was what everyone was doing. Well, suddenly you had all of these unemployed portrait painters. And to make things even more painful for them, they had these marvelous Northlit studios. So they went out and they bought a camera. They became photographers. And if you look at Edwardian and Victorian photography, you'll see in most part, in most cases, it's superior to most of what's being done today. Today it's flashy, it's, it's, it's cleverly lit, but it's not as a rule very well designed and people don't have much control over value. Very few professional photographers who are artists. I recommend Maria Cassindis, whose work I showed you tonight, and Cartier-Bresson. Certainly not Ansel Adams. When he shuts down to F64, every pebble and every crease is in high focus. I don't think that's design. So you're going to zone. And you're going to do more value step ladders because they are critical. They are critical. And this is a particularly nice, if blonde, meaning it's not too dark, treatment of everything. This does everything we want it to do. Zone two is brighter than three, and the tabletop dissolves as it comes into the vignette, and everything dissolves into dark halos or light halos. It's really very nice to cast shadows on highlighting elements that are too light. Isn't that nicely done? It really is. It really is. And it does look atmospheric. Now, if you were to make a fine line along this edge, it would push this in even more. And if as these came out, they dissolve completely into the vignette, they wouldn't make that contact and they would look as if they're four foot behind that side, which is what you want. That's what you want. You want to create the illusion. So when this touches the side, it comes up front. If it dissolves before it does, in the vignette, it stays back there. That's your homework. Next week, I'll introduce the golden section by having you explore the route two, which is one of the easiest rectangles to explore. However, if you understand one of the rectangles on the golden section system, you should be able to understand them all. It isn't as frighteningly complex on the outset as people feel it is. 
and the most complicated tool you need to be able to make your root rectangles is a piece of string that you tie around a pencil. So anything that simple can be very frightening. Are there any questions about what's expected of you for next week? The lighting. Good for you. Imagine your table is here and you have a series of bottles. I want you to come over 45 degrees so that your highlight falls on the sphere and you have that kind of a core. And to get it, you're going to have to come 45 degrees up here. So you're, 40, you're coming forward of this. So in effect, if we bring this all the way out, this triangle is on that pyramid. 45 degrees from that, and that will give you the glitter point on the sphere and the core in the third, and now you have the light coming down here. And that's how you light it. Do you see? Mm -hmm. That's it, yes. So if we were going in, say with the sphere, we take a 45 degree angle. Um... Same thing. Put the sphere there and it'll fall in the same place. Exactly. That's Rembrandt lighting. It is the lighting that will give you the greatest projection of the third dimension <coughs> that you can achieve. If you light a sphere directly from the top, what happens is you get this kind of a shape. There isn't an ellipse. If you pulled your light farther forward, you could get this. And if you had reflected lights around here, and you had the highlight there, you could start to get some form. But compared to the Rembrandt lighting, where you have the light here, the core in the third, the highlight there, the cast shadow here, you're doing pretty well because it's as if you're lighting that box and you have the maximum light and contrast here. This is a half tone. You've got one, two, three faces. If you have less than three faces, you're not going to get the illusion of the third dimension. You have to be very careful. Now, nothing prevents you <clears throat> from working exclusively two-dimensionally. Very often Van Gogh does. Gauguin did a lot. The Egyptians did. Many of the Greek vases, if not all of them, were done as a two-dimensional silhouette shape. There are artists who made up Will Barnett, goes out of his way to stay two-dimensional. Seurat very often is two-dimensional. A lot of these people eliminated the third dimension. They were more interested in the flatness of the wall, the canvas. They didn't want to violate it. Many, many of the muralists wanted to respect the wall and didn't want to poke holes in it. So Pouvier de Chavannes, the French muralist, keeps everything very two-dimensional. He keeps the figures about the same size, and he puts them up higher on the wall. So you're always on that flat, flat wall. Cezanne does the same thing. Instead of moving back into space, he brings what's ever behind up, and behind that up, and he works up the flat canvas. He doesn't want to violate that flat surface. He's a purist. He's a classical artist. Now, he wasn't as a young man. As a young man, all of his paintings were violent. Oh, what he was doing to the ladies in his paintings. But he finally gets older, and as he goes into transition, he becomes very much a classical purist and a brilliant, brilliant painter and a grandfather of much cubism and modern art. He really opens. Well, you know, you think about it, Seurat, uh, Cezanne, and Seurat. Seurat, Cezanne, and Van Gogh had an enormous impact on Expressionism and modern abstraction.
Monet too, because his, his water lilies are pure, abstract expressionism. Finally, he's getting credit for what he did. He was sitting in his huge studio as a very old man on this overstuffed sofa, painting the water lilies that he was going to give to the state. He'd finally browbeaten them into building a museum. The French never bought his stuff. All of his stuff is in this country. And he wanted to leave some legacy, so he promised all these big paintings. He's sitting on an earthen floor on this great couch with this huge wooden pallet. And there are all kinds of reporters and visitors standing around watching him paint this thing that's as big as that wall. <clears throat> and he has a crank so that he can crank this thing down into a slot in the, wood, in the earthen floor so he can paint the top of it and then he can raise it. He's a big man. Just getting up was a problem. Probably needed a crane. So here he's moving this painting up and down and he's got this, this couch on wheels and he's sliding back and forth. And one of the reporters was reputed to have said, Master, how is it? You've always claimed throughout your life that it was important never to work away from the motif. Always be in nature. Always have the subject in front of you. So Manet, Monet, rather without turning around, said, <coughs> Shut up. And on that note, I'll say good night. Take care. See you next week.